Pace from nine to five. This is Mitch, and I'm here with Pace Morby, and we've been all in the green room talking for probably way too long. I thought, shoot, that was some good stuff. We probably should have just turned on the record and just had that conversation going. Um, so Pace is the star of triple digit income or triple digit flip on A&E triple digit flip on A&E and um, we were talking a little bit about that process once upon a time A&E followed me around for flip that house in San Antonio and I was asking him about how that business really works and it was very interesting to hear his take on it he's does about 400 wholesales a year he's out of Phoenix Arizona is that right Phoenix okay. Arizona he does about 400 wholesales a year but he he also does sub twos and rents them for the most part uh and has about a thousand houses that he's carrying uh and collecting rent from i think he said out of the thousand he has about a 30 30 of them are seller you sold them seller finance notes the rest of them is true rent income correct right uh you also said that about 30 percent of the thousand houses that you that you rent the seller finance them to you right correct Right. So um, I love this conversation because as P Pace knows, and y'all know, I, I'm a, I, I don't like renting houses myself. Could be that I was the worst landlord on the planet or, <laughs> or, or I was dealing at such a, a low economic echelon because when I started in my mind, I, I had to buy at the bottom, which was the war zones, which is the hardest place to collect rent, which is the hardest place to even hold the house together because they'll tear it down in a New York minute. And maybe that's where I went wrong. But either way, I ran into seller financing and I liked seller financing a lot better because all I was responsible for was collecting the payment. However, you have to get into some kind of forever strategy, something that you hold forever. Notes are temporary. So I went into storages. Pace stayed with the houses. Do you do any apartments, Pace? Yeah, we just closed on a 408 unit, $109 million acquisition in Charlotte two weeks ago. All right. Here's a, another big difference between Pace and myself. I deal in my county and contiguous counties. This guy will go in, what did you say, 48 states? Or? We're in 30 states. We own assets in 30 states. 30 states. So this not afraid of not afraid of anything, not afraid of the distance, not afraid of the mark, you know, being in different markets. Um, I can't fathom, but that just goes to show you put your mind to something, you figure out how to do it, right? Well, what I think is interesting, Mitch, is I followed you for a long time. You're you're a legend and and um, like truly a legend in creative finance. And um, all the conversations behind the scenes, you know, us creative finance guys get together. We go to like these seminars and we'll go to dinner afterwards and have these very high level conversations. And Mitch Steven comes up in those conversations frequently. I want to make sure that the audience knows they're learning from somebody that um me, myself, and the people in my group have looked up to for many, many years. So Mitch, thank you for everything you do. One thing I want to hit on that is I would, I would venture to say the most challenging part of being successful in real estate is that there are so many different strategies to become successful in real estate. And finding out who you are as an individual and what path you want to follow is I believe one of the hardest things you could do as a, as a new person. Whereas Mitch and I use some of the same strategies, but we use them in different ways based on what Mitch is looking for and based on what I'm looking for. And when you're new, how do you make that determination, Mitch? How did you make the decision that owner financing was the right thing for you? Pace, Pace, I just wrote, I'm writing, I'm writing my, my seventh book. It's called uh, My Life in a Thousand Houses random thoughts and stories from a serial house flipper. I don't have to have, I'm not driving to any one direction. I'm just talking about whatever pops in my mind. And last night <clears throat> I wrote a chapter called cash versus cash flow. And I'm talking about exactly what you're talking about. There are so many strategies. It's mind boggling. And we don't have the time nor the energy nor the money to experiment with each one of them. You know, by the time you got to the end of the end of the list of strategies, the whole market would have changed. And the one you liked probably wouldn't even work anymore. You know, right. and that's another thing. Strategies change all the time. You've got to keep morphing and moving them. And then your talents start out at zero or pretty much zero. And then you start to get talents in certain areas and you have to mesh that your talent with, with with the strategy that you're morphing and you're morphing your talents 
and you're morphing the strategy to fit your market and you, and it's a hard job, but I can, I, I came up with, I thought was a really good idea. Pick, are you a cash guy or are you a cash flow guy? And that'll cut a lot of shit out right from the beginning. What do you mean you know by that? Mean? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I see these guys, they're hooked on cash. They're hooked on the flip, the, you know, a bunch of flips. They're hooked and they just cash, but they pay the maximum tax. And it's a kind of a glorified job. And I do want to revisit that because it's not completely true that it has to be a job. You can automate anything that you can think of. You know, you I, would, can, I would venture to say, Mitch, my personal opinion that the one business in all of real estate that is the most challenging to automate is the flipping business because it's heavily reliant on human beings to do the physical work versus mechanics of like property management, et cetera. I would say that fixing and flipping houses is a is definitely a glorified job. Right. But I figured out how to I figured out how to I haven't seen the last 400 houses I bought nor fixed nor flipped. I haven't same, seen same the here, last 400 sure. same houses. Here. Same here, but so, again, so I'm saying, I'm saying, well, but, but on the surface, some of these things are jobs. If you're a wholesaler, you know, you, ha you wholesale that house, you get one check, you got to go. It's to quote Jack Bosch, one-time cash, temporary cash, forever cash, right? Well, the one-time cash events are more like a job because you, you wrap up one, you got to go find another one and it just doesn't ever end. Yeah. Also, so that would be, that would be wholesale and fix and flip. Yes. So wholesale that's, that's, that's one-time cash. Yeah. And then or the second fix, one, or not fix and flip, because I, you know what I mean. The second, this yeah, you could wholesale it, right? Or um, yeah. the second one you're talking about is temporary cash, and I would assume you're talking about owner financing, right? Because I would sell a house for one hundred and fifty thousand, I would get fifteen thousand down, which is what I live on today and pay my bills with, and then I created another five hundred dollars a month positive cash flow, of which I have no liabilities. It's if the air conditioner breaks, it's not my air conditioner. I sold it on payments. So it's a real cash cow because there's really no reason short of a foreclosure for any money to go out. It right. just comes in. And so one time cash, temporary cash. The problem with those two things is eventually you burn out or you die or your or your Nort portfolio pays off. So you have to have a forever strategy to your overall plan and for you that would be storage units yes i i buy storage units i don't want to personally and i know that we have a different opinion but there's no right or wrong opinion it's what works for you uh, landlording didn't on houses where people lived in my houses didn't work for me but but i realized you had to be a landlord for something or else your income stream was at the mercy of someone else saying when it was going to end so I started buying storages because they didn't live in them, but it was still rent and it would go on until I said it ended, you know, the forever portion of my investment. So I, I flip houses, I wholesale houses, I seller finance houses to create a big old bucket of money. And then I take, and I do that with other people's money. I don't have any of my money in this, not a penny. When my, all my money goes over into storages. And there I rent little 10 by 10 and 10 by 20 cubicles until I say, I don't want to do it anymore, which will yeah, probably yeah. be never because once you have a management plan for a stupid little storage, storage rentals is way less complicated than a house rent. Agreed. And there's no plumbing, there's no electric, there's no hot water heater for, to, say, to speak of. And so that's my legacy I'm handing to my daughter who's been in the middle of my office for 26 years, you know. Um, she's running it right now and there's no need to ever sell it or cash out of it. I just will ride it all the way till my ride is done. And then I will hand over the train to my daughter and she can get on it and ride it to whenever. Right. And your strategy, the acquisition strategy that you utilize, which is generating leads, either wholesaling, fixing and flipping, or taking them down and then turning around and seller financing them out and creating notes is very similar to my strategy, right? The same way we acquire and your, I would say that you are one of the best at teaching, raising private capital, which is if I, if I could go back and acquire one skill sooner, faster, it would have been raising capital. Amen. Amen to that. At, at, how old are you, Pace? Um, 39. Okay. You know, what I would have, I didn't even start. I was 
dead broke at 34. I was just starting to get into real estate and really do some things at 36. And you, you're so far ahead of me. That was one of my, it took a long time for me to find myself, find where I belonged and what I did good. Um, it took me even longer to believe a whole bunch of other things that if I'd have believed earlier, and one was I was worthy of, of private money. Isn't, the biggest that, isn't that interesting? That's the mo I feel like that's the most interesting um, paradigm shift you have to have as somebody that is acquiring and building a legacy with, with other people's money is that one, you ask yourself the question, number one, where are these people? Where, where are they located? How do I find them? And number two, why would they give me money? Why don't they just go and invest the money themselves? Yeah. Or, 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 or why would they give it to me? I'm new in the business. Why would they give it to me? I had a bankruptcy five years ago. Why would they give it to me? I don't even speak the language that good. Why would they give it to me? I don't even own my own house. Why would they give it to me? I'm fat. Why would they give it to me? I'm ugly. Why would they give it to me? You know, it goes on and on and on. And, I, and actually, my partner, Mike Powell, was really good at getting money from his family. But then at, at, after that ran out, he stopped getting money. I said, what's going on? He goes, I don't know. I, I need to think about why I can't go past my family. I said, yeah. He comes back and he goes, I'm 25 years old. I don't even own my own house. These guys have these guys are you know wealthy, successful people that I usually talk to about this. Why the hell would they give their money to me? I, and that's when it dawned on me, you know, part of being a good coach is changing people's mindset or their, or their perception. And I just looked at Mike and I said, you know, you, you, you are putting yourself, you're making yourself way too important in this formula. No one really gives a shit about you, Mike. No one gives a crap about you. You know, Charles Manson should be able to get this money from prison. You know, it doesn't matter how many people he murdered. It's about the deal. What is the house worth? How much are you asking to borrow? And if you don't pay them as agreed, what do they get? And if this is good enough, what they get instead of getting paid as agreed, then they're going to give you the loan. Yeah. It's that simple. It has nothing to do with you. It's, it's about the deal. So many people, I think, get turned off, though, when we say things like, it's the deal that brings the money. They think, oh, that's just the cliche. No, no, no. Let me, let me tell a quick story about one of my biggest paradigm shifts regarding private cap capital. I've read your book on raising private capital. It's phenomenal. Um, the One of the best places to find private money is from deals themselves. And I'm sure you've done this before. You get a seller who's selling a property. They, they're getting a big check, whether it's a wholesale deal or whatever it is that you're doing. <laughs> And your seller will get a big fat check at close of escrow. Do you think that our sellers know what the hell to do with money to go back out and reinvest it? Absolutely not. So I have a seller. Her name's Desiree. I bought a property from her for $110,000. It's been about five years now. And I asked Desiree a simple question. So guys, anybody that's out there doing deals and you're talking to your clients you're buying deals from, ask your seller. What do you plan on doing with this money when you receive it? 99% of the time, it's to pay off a credit card, buy a new car, something along those lines. But then whatever's left over after that, they have no idea what to do with it. Zero idea what to do with it. So with Desiree, I said, Desiree, would you be open to letting me use that $110,000 to go buy subject to and seller finance deals from my other sellers? And you can be my second, my, my second note behind my subject to loans. And she's like, yeah, it sounds great, you know, but blah, 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 blah. And I go, you know what? Let me show you a deal. And so before I closed escrow on her deal, I drove her out to another property. I showed her the property and we were in escrow. So I took a black marker and I wrote on the wall in the kitchen, here's the deal. Here's how you make your money. And she goes, oh my gosh, why would I ever invest in anything but this? And so Desiree still to this day has $110,000 with me. I cut her a check every single month on the first of the month. She's been with me five years. That came from buying her house. I didn't even know who she was. And when I showed that to my partner, my partner's like, oh my gosh, do you know how many sellers that have received 300 grand, 400 grand, $200,000 from us buying their houses that we just didn't ask one simple question? What do you plan on doing with that money? 
And you, you, a good coach like Mitch will teach you one strategy, one question to ask somebody the rest of your life. And it'll make you millions and millions of dollars in, in raising private capital. It's freaking in, unbelievable. That's one of the things. And thanks for the kudos. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm humbled by this always because I don't, I don't see me from the outside. I just know what I do in here and, 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 and I keep my head down and I'm working. And it's nice to hear the kudos. Thanks. But uh, the, 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 the one thing I wish I would have got a hold of a lot earlier was the art of, of, of raising private money. The other thing was to delegate and get myself out of the middle of my business. I, 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 was, I stayed, I was the main reason my business didn't grow for many, 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 many years. I was right in the middle and it was right. I was the clog in the pipe, me. And it <laughs> took me a long time to see it, that I was the one freaking hole. I was trying to grow this company and I was all pissed off all the time because it wasn't growing. And it comes to find out the reason why it wasn't growing, it was I wasn't getting out of the way. So for your first several years in the business, Mitch, did you have an executive assistant or did you just do literally everything yourself? No, I, I, um, I did a couple of deals by myself, but I, I always had like a partner, a senior partner who, who really knew what they were doing. It was where I picked up a lot of information. I, I didn't get paid nearly what I, I might have should have got paid, but I was picking up knowledge like crazy, more valuable than in the end run than 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 money ever would be because with the knowledge I could make uh millions of dollars but <clears throat> very shortly after that I had to have just people to push my files through the closing because I had too many I was buying in 1996 my fourth year full time I did 150 houses going in so I sold 150 houses that year coming out or I had 50 at the end of the year, so I sold 100. So that's 250 transactions. And then I was selling the notes at the time. So, I mean, but just the 250 transactions, you know, we're buying a house and then selling it to someone else. If you take out the weekends and the holidays, it's 1.7 closings a working day. Wow. 250 minus 52 weekends, which is 102 days, you know, and, and they don't go like that. They don't go 1.7 closings a working a day it goes four days with nothing and then all hell breaks loose and <laughs> and you got eight closings in one day and you're trying to find the money and you're trying you know what i mean and and uh yeah you're so, calling your lenders and saying hey did you wire money hey i can't get a hold of you hey closing's supposed to happen in two hours can i run over and get a check so 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 we we always had some people the problem was and, and i'm going to throw this out there this is not a new revelation to my family I, I had a lot of family and it caused a lot of strife. I, you know, I, I needed, what I should have done was hired people I could fire. You can't fire family all that easy. I, I need, I should have hired and I'd have been better off a way back. I should have hired people I could fire right on the spot when they didn't perform or, or you know, or, or they didn't show up or, or whatever. The other thing is, is I quit hiring and training. I poach. I buy the best people in the business. They show me how to do what I want done in this chair. You know, I have my ideas and I, and I think I know how I want this chair to run, but the guy that I'm stealing from the next company, he should be able to tell me how it works. And I'll say, I want it to work like this. You know, you can do it like that, but I've been doing this for 15 years for this other company and how we do it's like this and it eliminates these problems. I go, oh shit, well, let's just do it your way. I, I, I was sitting there trying to train people in a chair that I really wasn't even that good at. That's why I needed someone to sit in that chair because I wasn't any good at it. Well, so, you know that you know the problem with that, Mitch, is that guys like you that are visionaries, guys like me that are visionaries, right? We can see what we want years in the future, right? And we can articulate it and get our, our team excited, right? We're visionaries. What we have a hard time with is we don't see that that is the most valuable part of the business, right? It's kind of like being Tom Brady, is that Tom Brady isn't just good at throwing a football. He's actually good at building culture inside of his community or inside of his football team that they all want to follow him into battle, right? So really, at the end of the day, that's your job is to be the quarterback. But then you have defensive line coaches, you have offense, you have special ops, you have all these things. And those are things like CFOs, COOs. Oh my gosh, I didn't hire a COO for like five years too late. And, but when I found a, a COO, I did exactly what you said right there. 
I go, I'm so sick of having to spend the first three to six months of teaching somebody what their job is supposed to be. And I'm paying them to learn their job. How crazy is this that and I have they to quit? And then you. they quit and go get another job for, you know, for a few thousand dollars more or something. Right. And so what I did is I just did what you said. I said, I'm looking for somebody who already has experience in this industry. I will pay you a $10,000 signing bonus and pay you $2,000 a month more than what you're getting paid right now. And I put that all over social media and I hired the best operations manager I ever got. It, it, unbelievable game changer. It like tripled my business in a year because things were actually happening. So I feel like delegation and raising private capital, if people could learn those two things in their first year, maybe first year and a half of being in business, you'd be 10 times further, 10 times faster. Yeah, I had mind screwed myself for many, many years that no one could really do this, that the business was kind of me and there were so many variables that I had to watch it. Um, and then I got with a coach who sat me down and said, so you flip houses and you think that's not a, uh, a, a business that you can delegate or automate. And I said, uh, might, might be one of the ones you can't. He says, what do you think's harder? Building a BMW, uh, you know, car from the minute it starts going through the factory to the end. What do you think's harder? Build, building a BMW or flipping a house? I said, building a BMW, of course. He says, well, they push one out like every, every, every 60 seconds. And the owner of that company's not there. And that's when I said, Okay, I, I, I'm just mind screwing myself, trying to make myself believe that this business has to have me, doesn't. <laughs> oh, paradigm shift right there! I love that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I got. And then what happened was, uh, how I actually see if you can relate to this. I was going to quit because it was so much, and I was so burned out wearing every hat. I was going to quit, but I couldn't make myself quit because it's too much money every year. You know million and a half two million dollars profit you know every, every every year and i was just going to put it in a box and walk away and i thought you know before i do that let me try to automate one more time and what the difference was was then i went to the mastermind that was specifically tailored to help me solve this problem and i didn't give a shit if i bought a house or not i didn't care i was trying to fix a business one last time before i just walked away and put it in a box and threw the whole income in 27 years worth of 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 legacy and in uh goodwill and everything i was going to throw it all away and so that's what but that's that was the difference the first four times i tried to fix it and failed i did not give myself permission not to buy 100 houses so i was trying to fix my business with what was left over of me after buying 100 houses which, it, it's it, it's like you were trying to put out a fire while pouring gasoline on it right Right, exactly. That's I never heard it put better. That's what I was doing. I was I was <laughs> pouring gasoline on this fire with one hand, and I had a hose on the other hand, and I was just burning up. And uh, uh, but this time I didn't care if I bought another house at all. I only bought thirty houses that year. And those houses walked right in the front door and laid down on my desk. You know what I mean? I right. I didn't wasn't even looking for those thirty. I was trying to fix a business. You know. And I had cash flow behind the business because I had the houses that I sell or finance. You know, if you sell or finance 300 houses with an average of $500 a month profit, it's 150,000 a month profit coming in, you know, positive cash flow coming in. I, I had earned the right to sit down and try to fix this business. And I went away and it took about a year. Um, actually, it took 14 months. But we took it one chair at a time and would, would hire somebody and then they would not work out or quit. And then we'd have to, that was the most heartbreaking thing. When it doesn't work out with that person and you put in so much time, right? Yeah. That's when, that's when, you know, my partner, Mike Powell, his dad runs a big lumber company. They have like 150 employees or something. I don't know. He said, when I need a tow truck driver, I don't go hire one and train one. I, I go to the company and I find the biggest badass tow truck driver and I offer him more money and I bring him over here and he shows me how tow truck driving works. You know what I mean? Right. Or, so that's what we started doing. We started poaching. Um, yeah, I had um, I had a, another influencer guy uh, a couple of years ago. He goes, you know, you shouldn't hire anybody unless you know how to do their job yourself. And I was like, that is yeah. literally the worst advice that should ever come out of your mouth. That's like telling me I should go 
learn how to drill teeth before I go hire somebody to get my cavity out. Oh, you have to learn how to fly the plane before you can take a trip, damn it. You can't hire exactly. a pilot to fly you or a company to fly you. You have to know how to fly the plane. So you just need to walk. That, that's exactly the advice. And I, I'm like, okay, you know what? I just hire professionals. And I wish, you know, when we were younger, you're, you're a blue collar guy, right? You, you grew up in a blue collar family. See, this is the challenge with blue collar guys is that we learn so in depth of how to touch everything we make money with our own bare hands. And then we're taught that there's pride in doing that. And there is, there is pride in, in phys. I'm a blue collar guy. My dad was a contractor. I was a contractor. I flipped houses for open door, Zillow, offer pad. I was their biggest fix and flipper. That's how I got into the industry. And I had the hardest time automated because the blue collar part of us is like, no, you do the work, your damn self, you cowboy up and you do the job. But then when you start trying to actually delegate and take it from a hobby to a business, the, that is the mental break that we have to go in and shatter that belief inside of our head and go, no, 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 I can't get there on my own. And so you go and you joined a mastermind and that mastermind taught you, here's how you delegate. Here's how you find the right people. Do you remember the first per person that you found with, that was like a key person in your business that changed everything? Yeah, well, it started with partners. I would find, I would find, I would get with the right partner and I would, it, it, it would say, wow, we're not one plus one. We're, we're one plus one. We're not one plus one equals um, two, two. We're, we're, we're one plus one equals five, you know? Yeah, this is, what, this is what I tell people. I go, you can look at one plus one as it equals two. And that to me is not a good partnership. Or you can look at one plus one equals 11. And that is what you and Mike Powell and, you know, other partnerships that you guys have really, your alliances, same thing with me. I have a partner, name is Cody Barton. Nobody ever sees him, but he's behind the scenes running the businesses while I'm going full steam ahead and creating, I'm the boat. And he's the person surfing the wake and make and actually utilizing the wake to our benefit, right? And so um, that's what that's what you mean is good partnerships that have the opposite personalities of you that fill in the gaps that you you couldn't do otherwise. Yeah, and, and I, I see a lot of people that partner up that are almost identical, and you don't need a partner that's identical to you. You need one that's almost like has all the things that you don't have. That's what you're looking for in a partner. That's what you're looking for when you hire someone to take over a position they need to have uh, fill in the gaps of what you don't know how to do in that in that area so um, if, if i'm brand new let's say i'm i'm brand new like i haven't done a deal yet it, it would probably be bad advice to go and hire somebody right out of the gate until i have money coming in right and um if you have you no have money, to do the first couple of deals yourself right you got yeah, you have to get some, get some income in, coming right? in the yeah what and well, you need to know the business at least that well. You're going to go into this business. I mean, you need to know the basics of right. whether you're wholesaling you need, or flipping. You need or to have the framework, right? You need to yeah. have the framework. So, what would you, what would you say if you could go back all over again? <laughs> would you, you have, would you have started hiring in maybe second year you were in the business? When when would, do you think you would have started hiring, and what would have been the first position you would have hired? The the end of my first year because I quit in March of '96, and and I did 45 houses by the end of the year. I. I was I was ready. Um, I lived in a different time, and I lived in a, a town called San Antonio, Texas. Um, I had some revelations, you know. In San Antonio, Texas, this skyline right behind me. In 1996, you could buy houses for eight thousand, ten thousand, twelve thousand. They weren't in war zone, you know. Fifteen thousand, twenty-five thousand dollars was an expensive house on the lesser side of town. But on the lesser side of town, eight and ten and twelve. So I learned really quick. Um, no one would give me any money and I didn't believe in myself or, or even have the mindset to even go out and get private money. But what I did was I, I learned real quick that credit cards back then, if you had good credit and you sent off for the card, they would send you the card. They just checked your credit and gave you the card. They didn't check how much available credit you could get your hands on and run to Mexico. They just, if you had good credit, gave you the card. So I applied for 75 credit cards and got 55 of them. And I was buying houses on my credit cards. Give me 10,000 to buy the house. Give me 5,000 to fix it. And I'd have 350 freaking thousand dollars worth of credit card debt with 0% interest or 1% or whatever. And then I wouldn't even have the deal in 30 or 60 days. So I was buying houses with credit cards. So, but keeping track of that, I had, you know, I actually was fortunate. I had a, my wife would keep track 
once she got over the shock that we owed 350,000 credit cards because I didn't ask her permission, <laughs> once I avoided that divorce, which took quite a lot, um, then she got on board and started keeping track. But um, I say this, number one, let's, let's, let's delegate the low-hanging fruit first. This is books, income tax returns, receptionist filing, whatever. I mean, you know, let's get the low-hanging fruit off. Uh, uh, Things that you collections, you should never collect your own money because people don't get paid that much to collect it for you. We actually make money, right? When we buy this property, where it all starts is you buy a property at a significant discount. Is that not where the rubber meets the road in this business? Yeah, it's either a significant discount or really, really good terms. Yes, yes, a deal, however you want to frame it. The, you, that's what you get paid to do is to find the deal. And if there is a second, it's to find the money. If there's a second, you know, right behind that's to find the money. And they're almost equally important because if you can't find the money and you find the deal and you can't take it down, I mean, there's some creative ways to get it done, but still, yeah, they're but right it's, there it's, like this. It's also, you know, there's a lot of wholesalers in town. I'm sure that you have the same thing is that because I have the advantage of raising private capital, wholesalers will bring me deals that they don't have private capital for. And so I sit there with a, a net where I'm just capturing other people's deals they'll bring to me because they didn't learn the art of private money lending, right? I did. And so I have a superpower where not only can I find my own deals and make them work, but other people in town bring me deals because they don't have private lending. I have this, I have this thing, you know, when I speak, if I'm invited to a seminar or whatever and I speak, and I talked about seller financing and I said, I'm about to make the wholesaler sick. So if you're a wholesaler, go ahead and get your barf bag out now. <laughs> I'm going to make you puke. I said, you guys, you find these perfectly good deals and you sell them to me or you sell them to somebody and you make what, what's the average wholesale deal? In, 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 in my experience, they'll say between eight and 10, maybe $12,000. Okay. It's what the normal wholesale deal is. Uh, I said, okay. I get about that same amount for a down payment. But because I know how to get the private money and stay in this deal for 30 years, I'm going to make 360 months worth of $500 a month positive income. That's 180 grand potential. $500 a month times 360 months is $180,000 because you as a wholesaler got your 12,000 and it's over. I got a $12,000 down payment and they still owe me 360 months at 500 a month positive cash flow to me. That's 180,000. So the reason why I'm a multi, 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 multi millionaire is because every deal I freaking made, they still owed me 180,000. The one while you're struggling is because every deal you made, you got 12,000 and it's over. And yeah. the whole difference was the ability to find the private money. So if I was anybody out there listening, I would spend the next year learning how to master that art of finding private money. Because I, my course is called Pri Private Money Changes Everything. It's a real light course. It's not bulky. It's not heavy. It's just rich. You need to know what to ask and you need to know what to say. And you need to know how to answer the 21 objections, which is the only 21 objections I've ever heard. If you hear number 22, call me and tell me. But the mostly, <laughs> it, mostly right pace. Yet you can do the course and read the book and go to the movie all you want, but you have to get your ass out there and ask a few people or, or implement the strategy. It's a numbers game like anything else, right pace? Yeah. You ask enough people for money, you'll find the money. Yeah. So my, my little daughter, we've got a little three-year-old. She's currently learning how to swim. Right. And I have this analogy where I get all these people that, you know, they go and read books, they watch videos, they listen to podcasts, they do all this kind of stuff. And essentially they're trying to swim in the game of real estate, right? They're trying to learn how to swim in the game of real estate. And I ask somebody the other day, they go, man, I've been trying to get into real estate for two years. And I go, okay, well, if you think of, of getting into real estate, like learning how to swim, are you practicing swimming in the actual water or are you in the living room practicing swimming in the air? And they're like, what do you, what, what do you mean? I go, are you actually getting in the water and figuring out what the water feels like and muscle memory and moving with the water? That's 
what you've got to do. You've got to get in the water. You've got to take the action. Otherwise, nothing you're doing is going to matter. It's like you're practicing how to swim in the living room. It, you look like an idiot. And they, because this is what they said, they go, well, I don't want to look stupid. I go, you, I go, who looks more dumb? The person actually practicing swimming in the shallow end or the person in the living room practicing swimming in the air. And they yeah, go, oh, the one in the living room looks pretty dumb. You look so dumb. And so the reality is if you're not in the, in the water and practicing, you'll never learn how to swim in this game. So I would say, you know, going back, delegation, raising private capital, and actually implementing it by going out and purposely making mistakes with mentors by your side, like having a Mitch, somebody you can rely on. I think you guys do a weekly call. Um, what, what day do you guys do your weekly call? It's Tuesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. So for me, like if, I, if I'm starting out, what I would do is I would go out, purposely cause those mistakes by getting in the water and saying, okay, I'm going to try and say this to a private money lender, or I'm going to go through the contacts in my phone and I'm going to use the words that I've, I've taught from, I've been learned um, by, by Mitch. And if I screw up and I get stuck, well then come into the Tuesday call and ask a question. Now, now instead of you asking a question because you're curious, you're asking a question because it's something you're actually dealing with. And for me, that is one of the biggest things that holds people up from being successful is they, they're not implementing information. And what's happening is you, you and I receive the same information, comes into our brain, and we have to make a decision. Is that information interesting or is it important? If it's interesting, that means you're not actually going to use it. If it's important, it means you actually are, you can go out and use it immediately. So is the information you're absorbing, reading, learning, is it interesting or is it actually important to solve real world problems you're currently interfacing with? So private money lending, delegation, and actually jumping into the water, that I, it's so funny because people come to you to learn creative finance, right? They come to you to learn creative finance, but the reality is the three things they, they really should learn is how do I implement, how do I raise private capital, and how do I delegate this and turn this into a real business are the side benefits that are worth tens of millions of dollars. So that's why, I mean, I'll, I'll take anybody on the on, on the weekly call because I don't know who's really going to make it or not. And it's such a small amount of money for the uh, amount of information. You know, it's uh, $4,000 for the year and it comes with 500 hours of archived calls. Like if you actually listen to those 500, you would understand the ups and downs and the problems and the successes of real estate. You'd be way ahead. Um, but like you said, really learning comes from learning on the job, on the job training. Because because once you've lived through a lesson, you don't, you're not likely to forget. And the other thing is there's confirmation on those calls. You see people and you hear people week after week that don't sound or not any smarter than you. And yet they just made 50 grand. And you know it's not contrived because we were talking about that deal two weeks ago when it was just an idea. And then they got the contract the week after that. And then and then they they did the work and they had some trouble with some contractors. And then they put it up for sale. And now it's been that that call, that, that situation's been watched for six weeks on this call. And then he makes 50, he calls one day and says he made 50 or 100 grand. There's some real validation for people going, okay, this isn't bullshit. These people are really making some money. And if they can why can't I? And that's where the call helps a lot. The other thing is, is you can avoid a lot of mistakes because you can hear a, a, a lot of what people are doing that's wrong before you have the chance to make that mistake. And there, the business is unique every deal, but there are limitations to how many, really how, how much goes on. There is a limit to it, you know? Um, every deal is unique and they might have different pieces from different directions but at the end of the day they're all kind of the same pieces so uh, people can I, I i really believe in the call one of the reasons i'm still on the call after seven years is because not because i like giving up my tuesday night every tuesday night but i learn a lot from the call myself and i've been in the business 27 years these people make me think about situations that i never thought of they, they can get themselves to some crap but i thought you must have had to really work to get in this bad. Now I'm trying to figure out how do you get out? And then I, you know, or as a team, we figure it out. It's really rewarding for me just 
in the educational department. That's why I'm still on that call after seven years. Right. Have you, have you, do you, you offer a call, right? You said four times a week. Yeah, but our, our stuff is, our stuff is sold out. So it's hard to, it's hard to get in. We, I don't think we're opening up any spots for another year or so. So I, I wouldn't worry about me. If you guys want to learn anything about what I'm doing, you guys can, you know, check out my YouTube channel, stuff like that. But I, Mitch, I've been learning from you, man. Uh, you're, you're, you're a legend in the game. <laughs> we learn from everybody. I mean, who did you, who did you, who all did you study? So I grew up in a household where my father has 12 children and my dad could never, it was never bankable for a house large enough to house 12 children, right? And so my dad was an accountant during the day and then he was a painter at night and he made more money as a painter on nights and weekends than he did as an accountant. And so all of that was under the table money. So growing up, my dad bought every house direct to seller on seller finance subject to or on lease options. Now we don't live in Texas. So we, you know, lease options are a little easier outside of Texas, but um, I watched it my whole life. I watched my wife, my, even my mom is a seamstress. And when they were first starting out, my mom would go to like Michael's or like a craft store and say, Hey, can I get a line of credit or a credit card from you guys? So I can take materials, turn them into dresses and suits and, you know, dolls and stuff like that and go out and make money. And she was rejected. And so my wife, my, sorry, my mom found somebody in her church that let her use her credit card. So my mom would then use somebody else's credit card, go to Michael's, buy materials, go sell those materials and go sell those products and pay the credit card off. And her friend who let her borrow the credit card, a little bit of return. So I watched my mom using private money. I watched my dad use creative finance all the way growing up. But it didn't dawn on me because my dad never used those strategies as, cre as um, income streams. My dad only used those strategies to house his children. And so it never struck me until I turned 30. Literally, I turned 30 and I'm like, wait a minute. What the hell? Why am I a contractor with 250 employees when I should be buying the houses instead of fixing and flip? I, I, I flipped 7,000 houses for Open Door, Offer Pad, and Zillow before I ever flipped a house for myself. Unbelievable. Crazy. And it was, and you know what's funny, Mitch? It's because I didn't believe I could do it myself. Well, I, or, or there's a different theory, and I want to ask you, did it get to a point where you'd had enough? Because when I'm looking for like my students on the one-on-one -on -one level, I'm looking to see whether I've had enough of this shit meters pegged. It has to be pegged way over in the red because right. that angst, is what gets people off their ass and gets them uh, to, 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 to bolster up what it takes to be your own entrepreneurial guy. You know, it takes some angst. Like I've had enough of people telling me when I can go on vacation, how much I can earn. Uh, uh, I've had enough of people telling me how I have to dress, what time I have to, to get up, what time I can go home. I've had enough of this shit. Yeah. And if that's pegged over there, then it takes a certain amount of angst. I don't, so did you have that angst or did yeah, you just- Yeah, here, here, here's, here's where my moment was, okay? So I, I learned to be a contractor for my dad, right? So when I was young and I wanted to make 20 bucks, my dad would take me painting with him. So I learned to be a blue collar guy from a young age. So what did I do when I, when I um, got in my 20s? I started a construction business, right? Pretty simple. Learned construction from my dad, jumped into construction. But I also learned creative ways to build my businesses from my dad and from my mom. So what I did, really stupid, but also very smart, um, I just took it to a, an extreme and it burned me. I would go to customers that were flipping houses like Open Door, OfferPad, Zillow, or other local fix and flippers in Arizona. And I would say, hey guys, I've got a line of credit and I've got credit cards and I've got cash. If you don't haggle me on my prices, I will fund your construction on your flip and you can pay me my full, my full bill when you sell the house to your buyer. And so I blew, my business blew up. I went from a million a year to $25 million in revenue a year just because I was creatively thinking, how do I fund other people's construction, right? Well, I had one guy that, um, what was, that ended up running a Ponzi scheme on me. 
And I ended up losing all of my money. The day my daughter was born, I got a bankruptcy letter from him. He, he filed bankruptcy and all the money he owed me for the last four years of accumulating all me funding all of his renovations, he just wiped the slate clean. And there was that moment where I'm like, here I am thinking I was building a business and a legacy for my daughter and for my children. And one man wiped me clean. I have no control. I have no aspect of control whatsoever. And I said, F this. And in six months, I had my business completely shut down and I was full-time in real estate and I never looked back. Wow. Wow. Um, everybody has their time in the woods and I don't care who you are. Everyone has that story. I mean, you know, uh, it's almost like a requirement. The, the difference is you didn't quit because a lot of people would have went in a hole or went in a bottle or, you know, checked out. Um, said the business was a scam. No, the business isn't a scam. You just got, you know, you just met, you just met the con man. And there's, and there's, there's good ones and there's great ones. I just finished two days ago, a story on con men, how to recognize them and, 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 and how to deal with them. If you want to beat them after you've already committed the sin, you know, of, of investing with them. Um, Ooh, I got I got to hear that. Cause I, I just. You know, I'm not good at this, Mitch. I, I see the good in everybody. I gave a guy a friend. Oh, I was the worst. I was the worst, too. You see the, and here's the problem is like when you um, operate with a belief that everybody operates the same as you, you get addicted to believing everybody is as trustworthy as you. True. And what Fairly. happened is, you know, if I borrow money from somebody, I've never defaulted. I've never had an issue. So I just assume subconsciously that everybody's the same way. So last year I gave a guy $250,000 and he strung me out, strung me out, strung me out until finally I just sent him a text because he won't pick up the phone. I just sent him a text. I go, I'm screwed, right? Because I'd rather just live my life knowing I got screwed than spend any more time chasing you down for this $250,000. And he says, honestly, yeah, you're screwed. I go, thanks. Thanks. That's all I needed to know. I'm never going to collect the money. I'm moving on. And the re you know why I lost the money is because I loaned money to somebody without it being tied to real estate, yes. which going back to private money lending, the greatest return for your investors is the freaking money they give you. That's tied to actual real estate. Yeah. And their worst nightmare that you don't pay them is actually going to be your private lender's biggest coup, because if they've tied themselves to the right collateral, which I don't ever present a deal that isn't the right collateral. Anyone in the world can say, well, oh, that's more than fair. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so you wanted to know about con and the cons. You want to know about, I mean, the first thing is to recognize. Them. So I'm curious. The guy that got to you, either one of them, do they have angelic facades? Yes. Who do they say they are? They're a pastor, a policeman? What, what, what do they say they are? Uh, they, they're a pastor. Okay. All right. Um, was the return for you over the top big? Um, or were you it doing it as a friend? It wasn't the return. It was the prompt. So the first person that wiped me out millions of dollars, like millions of dollars, that first person, the big origin story of how I got into real estate, that person didn't promise necessarily a huge return. They promised a steady flow of projects for my construction business that I would never want for more projects. So big, big, big promises. For a job again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'll never have to spend money on marketing ever again. I'll give you more projects than you'll ever be able to handle. So this guy calls me on one of the Tuesday night calls. And this is where you can't sub out to an underling coaching. I mean, I can't sub out my 27 years. So he says, I got a, I got a $135,000 house I could buy for $35,000. I said, well, how much work does it need? He says, it needs the front yard mode. I said, you have a contract? He said, no. I said, why? He goes, I don't know where I'm going to get the money. I said, don't worry about that. Go get the contract. Get 45 days to close if you can. Get at least 30. Next call, he comes back. I got the contract. I said, did you get 45 days to close? He said, yes, I did. I said, did you have him initial the 45 days? Right where it says 45 days to close. Did he initial that? He says, yeah. I said, because that 45 days is going to be real important. We may need every minute of it. But anyways, so then he goes, next week he calls and he says, I have a problem with my house, my deep, my big deal. I said, what? He says, the guy says, if I don't close by Friday before noon, he's walking the deal, the seller. And my guy's saying, 
can he do that? And I said, well, it's hard to make someone sell anything if they don't want to, if they signed a contract or not. It's usually not really worth it. But I think we have a bigger problem. I said, who does this guy say he is? He says, well, he says his name is John Smith. I said, no, not his name. Who does he portray himself as? He said, well, he's a policeman. I said, okay, bingo. I think, I think, I think, I think we've hit a con. I said, number one, deals over the top for you. Do you think $35,000 for a $135,000 house where you just have to mow the lawn, do you think that's a little bit over the top? Yes. Number two, angelic facade, policeman, pastor, Marine, I don't know, whatever has a light, white, glossy glow of Christianity on it, that, that qualifies, you know? But the, 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 but, but, but the thing that always causes you to go back and look at these first two is the, is the third one. The third one's the red flag. It's untimely, uh, uh, unreasonable time pressures. And once you see the unreasonable time pressure, that's when you go back and you start looking. Is the deal over the top? Is this guy angelic facade? And if those three things line up, you got to start doing your research. And if you find out that he really is a con, which I've done this before and said, oh, shoot, I've already given the money. I've already lost control of the deed. This guy's got me. I, I, so the way you con a con back is you never let him know he's a con. And you promise him a much bigger deal once this one's settled up, a huge one, because that's the chink in their armor. That is greed and easy money. So I, you know, I once had a guy get to me for a $80,000 loan. I put up the money. He had the house. We we're going to split the 150 sale. Well, I put up the money. The house sold. He had finagled the deed out of my, you know, he, I was very young in the business. He had put the deed in his name. He sold it, all the money went to his account and he was not paying me. So I went in and said, hey, you know, everyone else, I could hear the screaming in his office and they were just coming out and another person would go in and they were screaming at him. And I walked in and said, hey man, <clears throat> this is the greatest deal ever. I said, I, I love this business. I love this business and you are so smart. And I started building their ego and I said, you know, I, I got another one better than this one. It's 450,000. My dad's going to put up the money and it's worth 700 and I've already got it bought and I think I already have it sold, but it's going to foreclosure on Tuesday. It's Friday. I got to settle up with my dad today or Monday morning so I can get this foreclosure before it goes to foreclosure. I already got the people willing to sell it to me. And so he settled up with my dad. He settled up with me. In the hopes of getting the next con. Because he was going to get into me for, he was going to own a 700 grand house. I said, let's do the paperwork just the same or, and that's the other thing you look for in cons. We'll do the paperwork later. Go ahead and put up your money. Well, my, my word is my bond. Uh, if they go on and on and on about their Christianity, better check them out fast. I mean, you know, if they, if they got big Christian symbols on their construction trucks, you better check them out. I mean, I hate to say that because I'm a Christian and I, I like, but you know, when people just keep ramming their Christianity up front, then it really puts my red flags up. So that's my, that's my spiel on yeah, it, I have, it, the, I have first guy, many the first guy that took me for any money, the, when I originally met him, Mitch, he says, hey, my name's John. You can trust me. I'm a Christian. Literally in his introduction, it was, you can trust me. I'm a Christian. It was he led with the the angelic facade. I've never heard of anybody using that, but that is. I, I would have, I would have, I would have, I would have run that guy to the end. I mean, you know, at some point you even say, "Hey, I'm willing to make you the loan. I need your social security number. I need your deal. And I'm doing a background credit check, and I'm doing all this shit, or I'm not doing anything." When they lead with, when those three things line up, you, you, you do things to kill your dealer because. You might feel bad that you killed the deal that you were excited about because if you start asking them for certain things, like if you can't research them in the background without them knowing, if you need to ask them for their social to really get to the bottom of who they are and they don't give it to you, then you'll lose a deal. And always in your mind, you'll be wondering, I wonder if I offended that guy or if he ran away because he was con. The deal is, if you ask me for my social and you want to do a deal with me and we're going to do a deal, I'll give you my social any day of the week. Right. You know what I mean? I'll give you my date of birth of my driver's license any day of the week if we're going to go do a deal together and it's and it involves some reasonable amounts of money because i might i i don't have anything to worry about yeah we, you know? we i just recently started adding so i have a credibility packet that i give to my private lenders and it's my my personal credit score my company's um you know 
bank balance and our profit and loss for the last year. And then I also give them now our schedule of real estate owned. So it shows everything on a spreadsheet. We give them the, to them in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. They can go and copy and paste the addresses, go up, look up, look up county records, see that we're the actual owners of the property. And they go within two minutes, they're like, wow. And nowhere did I need to tell somebody that I was a Mormon missionary and I did this and I did that. And I was an Eagle Scout and all these other things. Those things are nice little cherries on top, but I didn't buy the cake for the cherry on top. I bought the cake for the cake. So show me the cake. Where's the paperwork? Where's the credentials? What's the deal look like? Everything else is just cherry on top. Yeah, um, to, to, to your credit, uh, uh, one time I, I, I was going to talk to one of the biggest fish in San Antonio, very wealthy man, very successful, very respected and known. They said I had 10 minutes with him, 10 minutes and only 10 minutes. And I went in with my tax returns. I went in with my, with my spreadsheet with the kind of deals I do and explanation. I went with my driver's license, a copy of my social security card and 200 and two $100 crisp $100 bills right on top. And so he was going through the files. He was going through my little thing. I took my rubber band off. I showed him my spreadsheets, what I do. I explained what I do. I, sh I showed him uh, a, a, a tax return, last two years tax returns. And then I showed him my driver's license and he, he, he looked at my social security card, copy of my social security card. And he goes, what's the, what's, what's the two $100 bills for? I said, it's for a private dick, a private detective. Hire anyone. And put them on me. Do you have everything you need? He handed me back my two hundred dollars. This is about wealthy people. They make decisions really fast, and when they make decisions, they don't. They don't. They, they go in hundred percent. He says, "I don't need. Uh, I don't need the private dick, so you can have the two hundred dollars back." He said, "How much you want?" I said, "Man, a half a million or five million. I'll, I'll use whatever." He goes, "Why don't we start with a million? I mean, it, it, ten minutes." But it was from it was from the two hundred dollar bills. I really think it was like, what's the what, what what's the two one hundred dollar bills for? It's for a private detective. You hire anyone you want. They're about one hundred fifty to two hundred bucks. You they'll know everything in the world about me with this information right here in about twelve hours. So, and he just gave it back to me. So I love that. Um, idea. I love that. That's so good. You know, because well, so about the cons, I have conned many cons back. They are much weaker than you think. Their greed is so high. The trick is you cannot let them know that you're a con. They're usually narcissistic and ego, egotistical, narcissistic in the, in the sense that they don't believe they do anything wrong. They be, the pathological uh, con man doesn't even believe that he's doing anything wrong. Then there's, there's the diabolical con man who knows and doesn't care how much he, he's going to hurt you. He just wants your money. You know, he's hiding behind the fact that all's fair in love and war. And if I can beat you on the, the business battlefield, then you deserve to lose. But he yeah. knows that he's going to hurt you. So there's the two kinds. Either way, you can't let them know that you know that they're a con. I learned this from The Art of War. I read a book by Sun Tzu, The Art of War. I didn't get a lot out of that book, but I got one thing out of it. One of it was, if you recognize a spy in your camp, the tendency is to run point he's a spy arrest him and then we hang him in the camp by the end of the night and and i celebrate a a, a, a a tiny little victory in the war or i could shut the hell up send the spy home with wrong information get the enemy to move into to vulnerable positions because they think they know something and then i can kill them all and win the whole damn war and if you want to win the war with a con you can't let them know that you know that they're a con and you have to set them up with a much bigger deal. And you need to do it in phases. You can't do it all in one conversation or it becomes too obvious. One day you talk to them, hey, I'm working on a deal. Next day, hey, uh, how's it going with the, you know, uh, I, I think I got this deal. It's gonna cost about 450,000. You kind of string it out, you make it seem real. And then at the end of the day says, I gotta pull the trigger on this, but you know, you gotta settle up with this other one before we move into this. I'm just gonna roll it all plus more into the next one do it the same way we did it before. I don't care how you did it. We'll, I have to do this so fast. I can't even worry about paperwork right now. I'll sign paperwork later because that's another thing I listen for from the other side when people are saying, oh, why don't you put in the money? And we'll get the paperwork done next week. You know what? When I hear that shit, I'm like, oh, 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 no. Who are, who are you? 
And that's when I start doing the research. Amazing. Um, I, I, it's worked for me four times in a row. Um, two of them were me when I was young. And then two or three other times, I coached students who got con and they got the money from their con. That's amazing. So where did you make this video on your YouTube channel or where, where is it? You said you made a video a couple of days ago. How to recognize a con. I, 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 I'm writing about a chapter a day. I have ADD, so my chapters are really short, but I just take things that have happened to me and I just make them into the story. And I wrote that story two days ago about the cons. And then the, then the, the day before that, I was writing like how to beat these cons. So there's how to recognize the con. And then there's another chapter, how to beat the con. If you, if you, if you want to try to beat them, you know, if you've got nothing to lose because you've already gotten out of control of your money or your property, if you have nothing to lose, then you try this. You know, it doesn't hurt anything. The only thing you can't do when you're conning the cons is you can't, you can't, you don't have exactly as much leverage as the con has. The con will forge documents. He'll forge, he'll forge notaries. He'll write hot checks. You, when, when you're conning a con, you cannot break any laws. You have to con them with illusion. You know, you can't con them with forged documents or anything. It's not going to do any good to beat the con at his game if you become a criminal right. in the process. You know what I mean? So, so, so um, I actually studied cons for a long time. I studied them because, you know, if you look back at the cons, they make so much money. And if they would just apply the talent that they have it, within the boundaries of the law or, or, or integrity, they would have they would never worry about money or or, or, or be broke ever because they're so talented they are isn't so that, talented. isn't that so true the problem is is the reason why i was studying them was because i wanted to know how do they get these people's confidence like this the problem is some of the things they do i can't do i can't promise someone a 200 percent rate of return they can because they're never going to pay you they right. can promise whatever rate of return they want so i'm limited by that um they can they can um, break laws and, and, and do things I can't do. But still, I, I'm very intrigued about how these con men and how their lives are so long, it seems like people would catch on to them. But they just move from place to place to place and they start over all the time, always starting over. And they move magnificent amount of money. Uh, Bernie Madoff, why the hell did that guy have to lie about all that? He was a smart guy. He That's what I'm saying. Could he somewhere else. Most of them are. Um, they prey on your kindness, your naivete, your uh, your integrity, your 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 your, your givingness. Uh, a lot of times, your Christian values, which is why a lot of them use the evangelical facade, right? They they prey on your Christian values of, you know, help your brother and your sister and all of those types of things. They they prey on Bible stories. So, so what, what you have to pray on if you're going to go after them and try to get made whole, and I've never gone after them to, to get up on them. I just want to break even or just get my money back. Forget about my time. Forget about my half of the deal. Just give me my principal back. You know, but you when you're going after them, they only have one chink in their armor. And it's, well, they have a, a, maybe two, the, the ego and the greed. That's the two they that's the two biggest ones. So I I got that answer when I was in that waiting room listening to those people screaming at this guy and leaving. And then I would move up in line and another person would go in and there'd be screaming and yelling. And then they would, and I started asking, I started praying, like, okay, it's obvious to me I've been had. I don't have a leg to stand on. This guy has got me lock, stock, and barrel. Got where is the chink? Tell me where the chink, how do I get, how do I, how do I beat this guy? And I started asking in prayer, like, how do I beat this guy? And the, and the answer I got was, um, you, you can only beat them through their, their, their ego and their greed. So when I went in there, I was all smiles. I was the only guy that wasn't cussing him out. I made him feel like I was so friggin' dumb that it was almost irresistible to him to not to go for the 700,000. I looked, I made myself look so completely naive that he couldn't resist himself and lucky for me lucky for me um i don't know why i've never heard anybody talk 
talk about con uh, about that before. Have you ever heard anybody talk about cons before? No, I, I love it. I think that there should be a whole book, especially people getting into real estate and private money lending and doing deals with people because they're out there. I, I ran into a handful of them and lost a lot of money not knowing what you just said right here. This would have saved me millions of dollars and years of my life and anxiety and near divorce situations with my wife just, you know, because of the stress in our household because of con artists. Yeah, it's very stressful. And it doesn't do anything for your self esteem because but believe me there's there's greats at you know from football to the olympics to whatever and there are there are con men that are great they are great they are they, they they're top of their game and anybody anybody could get taken by them if you're not a little bit hardened and cynical and start saying you know i could blow over this point but i'm not <laughs> right <laughs> um Man, I appreciate you being on the show. I could talk to you forever. I uh, personally wanted to invite you to my ranch in Bigfoot, Texas. So whenever you want to come, we I think we'd have it. a great time. Anything you want to say to the say the new guys out there uh, before we wrap it up? Mitch Steven is a, is a legend. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I appreciate you, man. Thanks. Appreciate you, brother. Um, I'd like to thank Livecom, L-I-V-E-C-O-M-M. -M, dot com for sponsoring this episode please just go there and watch the little videos on the on, on the home page it's the reason why i have four days on the market my last um couple hundred houses and the last hundred houses i don't even put out any signs not even one sign in the front yard uh it's a very amazing tool it can be used for a lot of things can be used for a lot of businesses i'm just going to show you how i used it for my business and uh Check it out. It has everything to do with smartphone numbers, capturing incoming callers, cell phone numbers, and sending out text messages to people who have already contacted you about your product or your service. And it's a very, very, very inexpensive and affordable way to, 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 to advertise. Always a dead on bullseye. So, all right, livecom.com. Thank you. This is Mitch Steven with 1000houses.com podcast. Uh, we're out of here. Bye now. Thank you, guys. Skin chair robs me of my life.